Kidding. Chapter 7. Lies. The first word for chapter 13 is taper, which is probably a word you're familiar with in terms of if something tapers off, it diminishes or dissolves away or what have you. But back in the day, uh, which apparently was a Wednesday in the Puritan land, um, taper in this case, and still today, means a candle of sorts. The second word is office. And I imagine that most of you are like, well, I know what an office is, you idiot. Uh, I'm not an idiot. Um, idiot. But uh, to a certain extent, I'm going to have to read this one from the screen. A special duty, charge, or position conferred by an exercise of governmental authority or for a public purpose. So, there it is. An office is a job that has been given someone uh, by the government for a public purpose. And you'll see that one of the most famous sentences in the Scarlet Letter comes in chapter 13 and uses that word. Chapter 13 synopsis. Seven years have passed. Hawthorne uses lots of words to philosophize about philosophize? Philosophize. I'm a winner. Uh, Hawthorne uses lots of words to philosophize about Hester Prynne's evolution, from ignominious whore to kind of this kind of um, rogue um, prophetess. After a quick change, uh, and, and about two weeks actually, uh, let's get back to chapter 13. Paragraph 2. Hester Prynne did not now occupy precisely the same position in which we beheld her during the earlier periods of her ignominy. Years had come and gone. Pearl was now seven years old. And it's important to understand that everything from this point on kind of happens in real time, or at least real Puritan time. Her mother, uh, Pearl's mother, with the scarlet letter on her breast, glittering in its fantastic embroidery, had long been a familiar object to the townspeople. As is apt to be the case when a person stands out in any prominence before the community, and at the same time interferes neither with public nor individual interest and convenience, a species of general regard had ultimately grown up in reference to Hester Prynne. It is the credit of human nature that, except where its selfishness is brought into play, it loves more readily than it hates. Um, for those of your teachers who are just bound and determined to tell you that Nathaniel Hawthorne um, is a dark romantic, um, and to a certain extent, I would have to agree. But I think that last statement is really rather amazing. That um, except where its selfishness is brought into play, human nature loves more readily than it hates. That's kind of a bold statement and certainly doesn't sound too dark to me. About halfway through paragraph three, um, Nathaniel Hawthorne writes, Hester came, not as a guest, but as a rightful inmate, into the household that was darkened by trouble, as if its gloomy twilight were a medium in which she was entitled to hold intercourse with her fellow creatures. There glimmered the embroidered letter, with comfort in its unearthly ray, elsewhere the token of sin, it was the taper of the sick chamber. And I love that line, the taper, the candle, brings light to the sick chamber, but it also kind of ameliorates or... Um, lessens the pain involved there. It tapers it. Um, later in that paragraph, the letter was a symbol of her calling. Such helpfulness was found in her, so much power to do and power to sympathize, that many people refused to interpret the scarlet A by its, or by its original signification. They said that it meant able. So strong was Hester Prynne with a woman's strength. So we've gone from adulteress to Abel. Uh, took about seven years, but certainly the Puritans have indeed learned lessons they hadn't anticipated from Hester Prynne and her strength in her evolution. Continuing with uh, paragraph four, it was only the darkened house that could contain her. When sunshine came again, she was not there. Towards the end, Interpreting Hester Prynne's deportment as an appeal of this nature, society was inclined to show its former victim a more benign countenance than she cared to be favored with, or perchance, than she deserved. Now, one of the more um, interesting aspects of the novel is trying to figure out just what Hawthorne thinks 
of Hester Prynne and her deeds or misdeeds. And I think to a certain extent he's rather ambivalent. Um, you can disagree with me. He's certainly, like I've said before, not out there saying that you may live as you like, that go and be an adulterer, it's going to be fine. Um, but certainly um, he is not as judgmental as our Puritan friends. But being the romantic that he is, he also looks to nature for answers. And while nature embraces Pearl, um, as you can see with the sun always shining um, for her, nature still avoids Hester, because even though she certainly has been honest about her own sin, nature demands that um, the entire truth um, be seen. And you see that struggle between um, nature's forgiving attitude towards Pearl, and not so much as a judgment, but more of a demand of Hester to really be forthright and be honest, and to move on. Paragraph 5 makes the rather bold assertion that the Scarlet Letter had the effect of a cross on a nun's bosom, and the last few sentences report that it imparted to the wearer a kind of sacredness, which enabled her to walk securely amid all peril. Had she fallen among thieves, it would have kept her safe. It was reported and believed by many that an Indi Indian had drawn his arrow against the badge and that the missile struck it but fell harmless to the ground. Dun dun dun. Um, remember, uh, we're in the middle of the Romantic era and there's a little shout out to the supernatural. It's all over the place in this novel, but it's never quite quantified, or excuse me, I should say it's always qualified by usually this kind of parenthetical caveat. Um, it was reported and believed by many, we don't know, Hawthorne won't say this indeed happened. Now, um, Hawthorne really never has the romantic balls to actually say that these supernatural things happen. He just gives us a kind of inkling, uh, and that should be enough for the reader, apparently. I think in our modern sensibilities, we kind of demand a more forthright um, narrator. But remember, times certainly have changed. In paragraph 7, we have this short sentence, which to a certain extent is kind of novel in this novel, but it simply says that the world's law was no law from her mind, for Hester's mind. And Hawthorne takes that um, to this really exciting place, I think, in paragraphs 8 and 9. He writes that it is remarkable that persons who speculate the most boldly often conform with the most perfect quietude to the external regulations of society. Then, she might have come down to us in history, hand in hand with Anne Hutchinson, as the foundress of a religious sect. She might, in one of her phases, have been a prophetess. Indeed, the same question often arose into her mind with reference to the whole race of womanhood. As a first step, the whole system of society is to be torn down and built up anew. Then, the very nature of the opposite sex, or its long hereditary habit, which has become like nature, has become like nature. Does that mean that Hawthorne or Hester thinks that it's not really nature? That it's not nature's role to have women be these kind of subservient um, yes women? But listen, when it has become like nature, is to be essentially modified before women can be allowed to assume what seems a fair and suitable position. So, Hester Prynne, um, proto-feminist, the Scarlet Letter, had not done its office. What did the Puritans hope to achieve by branding Hester with this letter, by giving her this public office? You know that people were elected to public office, you hear that term. But to a certain extent, she was um, relegated to this office. And the Scarlet Letter had not done its office, had not done its job. And you'll see that, as you read, that it certainly failed um, its original purport in kind of shaming this woman, I guess, or running her off. I mean, Hester stayed. Um, Hester evolved. But later, too, the, the Scarlet Letter has another calling, one that the Puritans had not intended and one that Hester actually fails, but we'll talk about that later.